I'm Simon Brown, I'm host of Money Web Now podcast and hosting this session. We're going to be, ready to be looking at stockbroking, how to get started, where to start. We've got a bunch of questions. Uh, I'm joined in this session by Grant Mankies. He is uh, head of stock of, of uh, head of trading at NetBank Private Wealth Securities. He's got some 20 years in the business, is a registered stockbroker. Grant, really appreciate the time today. I suppose let's kick off right at the beginning, which really is when you're starting out, the first question you've got to ask yourself is not what do I buy and how do I buy it and how much do I need? What's your life stage? Where are you at, at, in, in, in the point of, of, your, of your career, of your earning and how far, I suppose, from retirement? Absolutely. Um, thanks, uh, Simon. Thanks for the opportunity and welcome to everybody. So, yes, you've hit the nail on the head. You don't start out by just buying shares. Um, we, we generally break up your investment life cycle or stages into three sections. Mm -hmm. So your accumulation stage, which is from 20 to the age of 35. Then your preparation stage is from 35 to 60. And then your retirement stage is from 60 onwards. Every stage has its own short-term goals, long-term goals, your risk uh, appetite, and of course your asset allocation. So if we use the first accumulation stage, there are young people, 20 to 35 years old, your short-term goal is to pay off your student loan, to buy a property. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, assets and the like. Yeah, yeah. And, and then start getting some of your emergency reserves going, so some savings. And I think uh, COVID made it quite clear that yeah. people didn't have enough emergency savings. The second thing is your long-term objective. So you want to start accumulating wealth, and you want to start uh, planning for your kids' investment, okay, their, their education. Now, if you think about the risk scale, you are very aggressive. Yeah. You want to invest in assets that have large growth, capital growth, uh, uh, growth possibilities, not a lot of distributions or dividends, and you want to invest in high yielding bonds. So pretty much in a nutshell. The person who is in the preparation stage, 35 to, to 60, these are um, investment professionals. They are at the highest curve of the earning, earning mm -hmm. potential. They have the ability to save a lot more. So their short-term, long-term goals are, are different. So the short-term goals are generally, do I have enough money to pay for my kids' education? And of course, we have to spoil ourselves from time to time to have a yeah, nice yeah. holiday. You know, you work hard, play hard, <laughs> get away on holiday. And then your long-term goal is around retirement planning. Because no matter where you are, you have to start planning for the day that you stop working, whether it's 60, 65, 63, depending on your employer. Your risk has now shifted to moderate. You don't want all that growth in those growth stocks. You want to start having a more balanced portfolio. And the balanced portfolio will have some, some blue chips or some large caps. And then, of course, investment grade bonds. Now we get to the people retirement. So let's use 60 plus. These people want to preserve their lifestyle. You know, we always talk about in South Africa, 6% of the people will retire comfortably. So you want to start that planning early. So when you retire, you, 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 have a, you maintain your lifestyle. And of course, you're able to pay for your medical expenses. Your long-term goal then is estate planning. What do you leave for your kids? How do you separate the assets, uh, the likes? Your, your risk profile has now shifted completely to, to moderate, you know, so passive almost. So you want to have assets like uh, dividend income funds. You want to have money market investments. You'll still have some of your, your large cap stocks, but you don't want the drawdown from your investments to affect your lifestyle because you want to maintain that lifestyle going forward. So three life stages, the accumulation stage where you build your assets, the preparation stage is where you maintain it, and then, of course, when you retire, to ma retire comfortably. Let's to just call it that. Comfortably. Yes. And, and uh, the retirement will be, to your point, you've got a, a boss, and they come to you one day and say, that's it, you're of the age, 
<coughs> don't, don't bother coming back tomorrow type of scenario. But, but moving from the first to the second stage, it, it's not necessarily a hard line in the sand. It's a bit of a, it, it's a process as you Correct. Sort of transition from one to the other. And, and for some folks, they might have perhaps, you know, maybe they want to retire earlier. Perhaps they're a little bit behind the curve and they started a little bit later. Mm. It is that sort of transition. It's like, well, I'm getting into the, the, the middle part now. Um, we need to start perhaps pulling back on, on, on some of that, 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 that risk. And then, of course, one day, eventually, the kids actually leave home. Yes, exactly. So it's all about your, what is your risk at that point in life? What is, what is important for you uh, at that point? As you mentioned, you don't just take a hard line to say, listen, now I've hit 36. I restructure my entire portfolio. Um, and now I change from growth stocks to uh, you know, large cap stocks. Um, it is a transition. Um, uh, it's better done over time and with the help of maybe a financial advisor or your stockbroker, mm -hmm. you can have that discussion around what is a large cap stock? You know, is it in South Africa the top 40 stocks? Um, or what are the bond issues? What are money market funds? So have a discussion with the stockbroker um, and they're more than willing to help you. Yeah, and that's and we'll come to it in more detail. A large cap, the top 40, but there are top 40 stocks and there are top 40 stocks. Correct. And, and the other point that you've driven home quite clearly as well is that I mean, we're talking around investing here, we're talking around stockbroking, but you've got other commitments within your life. You, you mentioned kids' education, you mentioned fancy bicycles and, and, and exotic holidays. Yeah. They, they, they don't happen in, in, in isolation or in silo from each other. It is that holistic picture. You said you start life, you frankly, paying off student loans. Yeah, exactly. I think it's, as part of the mm. investment life cycle, you have to have some goals and objectives. Mm. I think once you know what your goals and objectives are, you can then start building towards achieving them. So whether you want to travel and save for traveling or the fancy bicycles that people have these days <laughs> or um, uh, a holiday or kids education, it starts early, you know. Um, Rome wasn't built in a day, but it can burn down in a day kind of, kind of scenario. So the sooner you start investing, the better. People always ask you that question, when should I start? Uh, and, and the sooner the better. So if you think about someone, let's use a simple example. Someone starts in these 20 in that accumulation stage. They have a thousand rand to invest a month into whichever product. Mm -hmm. and, you, and the product is is a, a, a low growth product, let's assume 6%, and you increase your contribution by 6% annually, by the time you retire at 60, that investment will be worth um, 3.8 million rand. But if you're in a more aggressive product, so you still invest 1,000 rand a month uh, from the age of 20, you grow your contribution by 10%, you have a nice growth of the product as well, which grows by 10%, by the time you reach 60, your investment will be worth 15 million rand. Whoa. So there's a massive growth. People always talk about the seventh wonder of the world, which is compound interest and compound growth. So that's the, the, the scenario. Now you start talking about someone who starts later. They had some issues, they didn't have mm -hmm. savings. They start saving at the age of 40. So now you invest 3,000 rand a month and you have a low growth of 6% and you contribute uh, additional 6% annually. That product will be worth two and a half million rand by the time you hit 60. Now again, have another product that grows by 10%, same investment, contribution grows by 10% uh, by as well, that will end up at five and a half million rand. But it just shows you the sooner you start, even with a small amount, a thousand rand a month, which I'm sure most people can start affording at the age of 20, 25, will really reap rewards by the time you hit retirement. It is that. It's that, it's that time in, in, in that process. Absolutely nothing beats time. And a bunch of the viewers today will be, you know, a bunch of them will, will be on this journey. Uh, some will be young, in which case, <laughs> simply go out and start. I mean, you know, when's a good time? This afternoon's as good a time as any. For folks who've started late, I mean, we can't wind back the clock, but mm. there are, I suppose, hacks in a sense. Put more aside. Because uh, uh, yeah. you, know, you don't want to you don't want to go too aggressive too late in your life stage. I mean, maybe you can do a side hustle, maybe you can push back retirement if, if, if possible, but certainly you don't want to arrive at the age of 55 and say, well, I'm going to go into the massively high risk. Absolutely. Because, I mean, we've seen how that can go horribly wrong. Yeah, so it goes back to your, your goals and your objectives and associated with that is your, is your risk profile. So people always say, I want to invest and I want to make 10% return or 15% return. 
I think the second question that you have to ask yourself is how much are you willing to risk with that investment? Yeah. And at the same time that you do that investment, the risk profile comes into play. And then what are the assets that you are investing in? Is it a risky asset? Is it a large cap stock? Is it a, uh, a startup? Is it, well, uh, we won't get into cryptocurrency, but <laughs> um, you know, what are you willing to risk your money on? And at what stage? So when you're younger, you have a long term to, to retirement, which means that if you make a mistake, you can still correct it. But if you're in your late 40s or 50s and you've put all your eggs into one basket, one stock, uh, I think our previous guy mentioned Steinoff and many yeah. people lost a lot of money in Steinoff. So um, let's call it a fallen angel. But if you risk all your eggs in one basket and it goes horribly wrong, you're not going to be the, that person that retires comfortably and be able to afford medical expenses, not just living expenses. Uh, let's quickly go down that, that rabbit hole then. I mean, one of the, the, the keys we've mentioned, it, it's time. The more time you've got, absolutely that compound wonder of the world. Um, but the other one is, is diversification. Warren Buffett says it's your only free lunch in the market. Because, you know, there, there's always a story, oh, if I put everything into Capitec, you know, I'd be doing great. <clears throat> But you might have put it into African Bank or Steinhoff or Tongard or one of the many fallen angels. You need to have that diversity, not just across stocks, but across even assets. You've mentioned bonds, you've mentioned money markets, and, and, and have a little bit of each, which the, the percentages will depend on where you are in those stages. Yeah, exactly. I think um, so. equity gives you a certain payoff profile. Um, money market gives you some guaranteed income or a dividend income fund. And then you have some bonds, high yielding bonds or investment grade bonds, like I mentioned before. So as you create your portfolio, it's not just about diversifying, I want Anglos, Billiton, Sassel. You know, mm. Your portfolio these days, most stockbrokers can offer you a multi-asset class account, which means you can have equities, you can have bonds, you can have unit trusts, offshore investments, so it's around getting the right balance at the right time. So it, 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 it is a balancing act, but I think there are enough investment professionals and stockbroking firms out there that has uh, evolved over the last 20 years. 20 years ago, the, I remember the first online share trading platforms have evolved, and now there's a plethora of opportunities and choice for investors out there. As you mentioned, I represent NetBank Private Wealth mm -hmm. Security, so we're one of the, 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 the solutions out there. But it's around the client having, uh, being comfortable with who he's investing in. Um, it, it's not a risk thing in terms of who you invest in because everybody is regulated either by the FSCA or the, the JSE. But it's around who do you trust to talk to and who you trust to manage, manage your money or have a discussion about. Yeah, it's those discussions around it. And then it starts to open those questions of, you know, is it shares? Is it perhaps collective investment schemes such as unit trusts, mm. exchange traded funds in the, in, in the passive space? And, and that often can be overwhelming. I typically say to folks is, you know what, get yourself a unit trust or an ETF because at least now you're in the market. Now you can start to see things going up and down. It's not an equity, so it's not going to shoot the lights out. It's also not going to collapse in, in a heap. Um, and, and sort of start learning the ropes by taking some, some smaller positions, perhaps, as you're learning and understanding all the rest that fits around it. Absolutely. I think ETFs has allowed investors to get that interest in the market. So firstly, you're spending your hard-earned post-tax money, and you are uh, choosing a product in the ETF space. I think there are over 100 listed ETFs. Yep at this point in time. So whether it's sector related or market related or a combination of local and offshore assets, or if you want to get access to the MSCI World Index, you can now do it. You mentioned it's not as, I will use the word sexy as honing an uh, sure. individual share, but it's also not as risky. By having a ETF, you're asking a f asset manager to um, manage that basket of shares on your behalf. It has very low volatility, which means it's a nice, almost I will call it a passive investment, but it gets you interested in the market. You start understanding what, the, what that sector looks like. What are the shares in that sector or that basket that you would rather want to own on an individual basis? 
let's move into what do we do before before we start. And I mean, part of it is you know, make that decision. And a lot of folks are thinking, well, you know, the first part of you know, I'm starting, which ETF matters, which share. Actually, there's a lot that comes before that in terms of just getting smarter around markets. The lingo. I mean, we've probably dropped some words here, which we've got people scratching their heads already this morning, and and we're trying not to. But there is a a lot of fancy uh, words in the industry. Yeah. Um, it's small things like navigating the website. Yeah, I think uh, so. I'll I'll, I'll speak um, on 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 the, the NetBank private wealth stock working mm. behalf. So we have uh, created uh, multiple um, training videos that is published on YouTube as well as our uh, our website. It is available pre-login. So it talks to how do I navigate the website? How do I place a trade? How do some market lingo, what is PE ratios, what is headline earnings and the likes, um, some basic economic information, some technical analysis, and of course the very important one is how to place a stop loss. Yes. You know, so we cover all of those, those items and then it assists the, the, the investor around what is available through this website. In addition to that, uh, we have a call center that they can call. It's published on our website. And the people on the, behind the calls are also investment professionals. They've had more than five years experience in the market and they've hopefully seen most of it these days and can answer basic questions. We also have a trading desk. So if the questions get a bit more complex, they have the ability to escalate that to someone who's a registered trader and can answer those questions. I want to hone in on stop loss because a lot of th folks are going to think, hang on, <coughs> stop loss is more a function of trading, which is the shorter term in nature. Mm -hmm. We're talking investing, which is the longer term, years, decades, ultimately, into your, into your retirement. The point being is that even as an investor, <coughs> you need a point at which you say, this isn't working and I'm losing capital and I need to exit the position. Yeah, so, so st stop losses started out, I think, years ago with derivatives because they are so volatile. But if you think of these days, like I said initially, you have 100 Rand to invest or 1,000 Rand to, to invest. If, how much am I willing to lose? That is where your stop loss is. Whether it is, we'll use some more uh, word, trailing stop loss, which means if the market retraces a certain Rand value or percentage from last traded price or a fixed price at which you want to exit. That's very important. The other thing around, we talk about investing. We have had some fallen angels, which means that long-term goal of that share uh, had a massive issue. Or there are other stocks that are actually come end of life. We use Kodak, for example. Yeah. You know, <laughs> uh, the market has moved. We spoke about it earlier on. I have a, I have a, 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 a old camera which I was quite impressed with, which had 10 megapixels, and now the the cell phones that we have these days have multiple megapixels more than that camera. But that, that industry or that stock came to end of life and you should make a decision around cutting it before it gets to end of life. Um, pay the taxes if applicable, move on to the next stock that will allow you to meet your investment goals because diversification and, and rebalancing isn't just about changing the percentage weightings in your portfolio, it's around relooking the stocks. Do they still meet your objectives? And um, if not, make a change, move on to the next one. So I've got a question from Sean I want to come to in a moment, but you mentioned re rebalancing, and let's quickly touch on that, which is quite simply that, that you know, you, you buy a stock and it is great, and so it, become, you know, it does spectacularly well and becomes a huge part of your portfolio. That now becomes a risk, or you know, to your point, there's, there's a loser. We were speaking a moment ago about as you move through the different life stages, how you need to adapt your needs and, and, and requirements. You, you're, you're managing the portfolio. Part of that is going to be, well, I need to maybe cut back on this position a bit, or all of it. And I know a lot of folks worry about tax, but you're only paying tax if you're making money. Yeah, exactly. I think it's the byproduct we'll, of making money. We'll, we'll preface this by saying we're not tax experts, we're not giving tax advice. 100%. I think the, when you start out with your portfolio, it's like I said, in the, in the preparation phase, it's, it's, it's a more balanced portfolio. Mm. So let's use stock ABC. Stock ABC has uh, done something incredibly well and the stock triples in value. So you want it to be a balanced portfolio. It's now 30% of your portfolio, which means you've got single share concentration risk, which is nice to see when you look at your portfolio. Mm -hmm. When you start looking at what are the risks of this stock retracing below where you bought it, and that's where you have to make the decision, 
And it's a tough one sure. to say, listen, I'm reducing this holding um, to a certain point and then investing in, in, into the next thing. But it's at that point there, there are other stocks that have the ability to grow, maybe not as 300%, but 10, 15% over the next couple of years and, and will give you a decent return. Maybe the one that's outshot the lights out has hit its ceiling and it's never gonna go any further. And, uh, and the market, the rest of your stocks is gonna take years to catch up to get it back to a balanced portfolio. And, and, and that's where you manage the risk. You don't want single share concentration risk in a balanced portfolio. And it's a nice problem to have. Mine was Capitec. Back in the day, I think 08, I bought Capitec at 20 Rand and again at 40. And pretty much I've been a seller ever since hmm. because it just keeps on overwhelming my portfolio. And yeah, in hindsight, sure, would have been better if I just sold everything, put it in Capitec and left it. But it's about managing the risk because yes, Capitec's been a great investment story, but we haven't known that over the 15 years of journey. There, there have been risks, there have been uh, issues, vice for and the like. Sean's asking, how does an investor evaluate over trading by a broker in essence versus wealth accumulation for, for, for an investor? Uh, and I want to broaden his question a bit which is, and it kind of comes into the next part, which is you've spoken around the support that you can expect, people you can phone to, and it's going to depend, different brokers will have different offerings in that regard. How, how do you evaluate someone who, 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 who can help you? I mean, my sense is it's, you know, it's a sit down, a cup of coffee and a conversation, and probably with a couple of folks to make sure you find the person who you like, who you trust, and who makes sense to you. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, I'll draw that back into into people and interviews for, for jobs. Um, you, you find a, a, a level of comfort with the person you're having an interview with. You know, so that person will not only be, he's skilled enough to do the job. He got into the door, sure. all right? That's your broker. You, you want to have a relationship with that broker. It's a long-term relationship. If you're 35 and you're planning for retirement, that's another 25 years that you're gonna have to phone me at least twice a year to talk about your portfolio. So there has to be a relationship. You have to feel comfortable. Most of the guys are registered investment professionals. It's around having that relationship. So that's the one thing. And if you have that relationship, you're gonna have tough conversations because it's going to happen where I'm going to tell the client, we need to change your portfolio. And he must trust you, you know? So um, the, the relationship builds that trust over time and then you trust the, the advisor who gives you that performance and that, and that feedback. The norm in the market, if it's a discretionary portfolio around over trading, because brokers can't trade on clients' accounts if it's not managed or not discretionary. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe it's some more jargon. The, the one is a, a self-service account, so non-managed, non-advised account, and the other one's fully discretionary, where we agree yeah, so your stuff and I trade on your account. And the other's DIY. Absolutely. Absolutely. But, but the norm is around 20 to 25% of your portfolio is changed on an annual basis. So it, the, remember the investment professional isn't there to, to generate income out of executing for you because they charge an advisory fee, a management fee. So it's more in their interest to have you in the right stocks that gets capital appreciation for you and him. Mm -hmm. It's not around the 50 basis points or 20 basis points or whatever, 75 basis points that he earns around rebalancing your portfolio consistently. Because the cost will then outweigh the performance of the portfolio and he makes nothing. And the client will wise up and take their money elsewhere. Uh, but I liked your analogy of, of, it's a job interview. That's exactly what it is. I mean, that this broker, this advisor, ultimately they're gonna be, they're working with you. It's a different type of you know, professional relationship, but it is a professional relationship. Yeah. There's more to it as well. So now I, I've, 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 I've got myself all smart on the website. I've, I've learned a whole bunch of jargon. Um, and now it's the case of, well, okay, what to buy? We mentioned ETS, but let's touch a bit on, on, on perhaps sort of the individual stocks and, and going in and, and doing that work and, and, and that research. Some of it, I mean, you can listen to many of the shows out there. I'm, I'm sure you guys have got research you publish on, on, on your platform. Mm. And then, of course, the individual doing their own. Yeah, exactly. I think um, we're in an investment, uh, uh, a fortunate position. We have an investment team because we do discretionary portfolios. And a requirement to manage discretionary portfolios is you'd have to do your own, own research. And if the regulator or, or the ombud comes in, they have to review your research. So you have to put hand on heart and, um, and stand by it. The research is published on our website post-login. 
uh, you'll most probably find uh, research on the top 40 shares that we have in, in, in the market at the moment. It is a long-term investment research note. So it, it generally gets published twice a year post results of the mm -hmm. company. It is three years to five years investment base. So we spoke about tax uh, earlier on. Mm -hmm. If an investment is held for more than three years, your, uh, it's not income tax, it's capital gains tax, so a lower rate. So that's why most of your investment holdings are three to five years in nature. It is a fundamental analysis of the company. What do they do? What industry they're in? What has affected them positively? What has affected them ne negatively? What is their headline earnings per share? What is their dividend that they are paying out? And then our investment team makes an, an, a, a recommendation. So generally, um, the market sees buy, sell, and hold. Mm -hmm. um, we make an investment recommendation, so it's fairly priced, underpriced, or overpriced. Gotcha. Uh, and then based on the recommendation, um, we don't give you a target price because it's three to five years in nature. We don't really care around what it does today or tomorrow or, or a week later. Um, for entering it, but it's around the long-term view. So, uh, so that's for the investor uh, for the long term. In addition to that, we have clients who wants instant gratification. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so let's. It's so, Tuesday. I've got plans for tonight. <laughs> so the instant gratification comes either for derivatives or stocks. Right. So we call it trade ideas, and these are short-term in nature. The, the the trade ideas are also published on our website. Um, it will tell you what stock to buy. It gives you an entry price because there's an exit price attached to it. Mm -hmm. And there's an uh, entry and an exit price and a stop loss. Okay, upside, downside. Upside, downside, and then we say, and we give you a technical graph as to why we believe it and a little write-up around the company to substantiate why we're calling it. So long-term and short-term trade, trade investment ideas and trade notes are available on the website. Um, and the clients have used it successfully over the last 18 months that I've been with so, And this is the question that just popped up, no name there, but it is, from what you're saying there, when you're looking at the, the long term and equity, and you know, weirdly it could be the same share, they could, it could be Sassel, and it could be a long term view on Sassel, three mm. to five years, then it's going to be around the fundamentals. If it's a short term trade on Sassel, which would be days, weeks, maybe a month or so, yeah. that's when you turn to the charts and, 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 and look at the, the, the technicals. Yeah, so I don't want to offend the technical or the fundamental analysts out there because they, have a, they feel very strong around each and of their own methodologies. But what, for, what I do is I look at the fundamentals of the company, what do they do, what do they produce, which sector they're in, uh, what is happening in the market, and then just to substantiate that, what does a technical analysis show? You know, simple technical analysis, moving averages or something like that, relative strength index, and then just say, listen, the market is pushing it up or it has reached its top for the short term. It is definitely a sell as well, which is what the technical analysis showed. Long term, it's gonna go up in any case, time, weight, time value of money, all that sort of stuff. But you, you can do use both. We have the ability for clients to use both. Um, and it, it's, uh, it's recommended that yeah. you use both in, in trying to make shorter term investment That's what I decisions. I, I will find the share that I want to buy for the longer term and then I will look at the chart and say, well, if it's currently falling, mm. uh, let's see if I can't get it a few rand cheaper. And let's, mm. you know, I'm not the technical expert, but you can get a no, sense of, of, <laughs> of, of what's happening there um, and, and, and kind of you know, get, get, get smarter around that. Yeah. There's also in terms of the companies, and I think this is often overlooked, is that the, the, the viewers out there have got their own skills. They're in certain you know, industries. Maybe they're in banking, so they mm. understand the banks better than you and I would perhaps as, a, as an outsider. Um, maybe they're in mining and they, mm. they, they understand mining better. You've got your own skills, you've got your own experiences, and you never want to invest exclusively on that. But mm. you know, if you're building a preponderance of evidence, that can come to the, to, to the process as well. Absolutely. I think it's, it's key that you play to your strengths. You mentioned banking, finance, mining. You know, we've got a lot of uh, engineers out there, doctors out there that know their industry really well. You know, so they know what is happening, not only in their mine, but they have friends and colleagues at other mines. You know, what is happening with the possible strike action in mining sectors? What is happening with the Rand dollar exchange rate? What is, how much output are they gonna get? You know, what is the price of that commodity doing? Um, 
rising interest rates in banks, you know, what are the debtors books look like in, in banks? And it's not only the debtors book in terms of home loans, mm -hmm. it is your credit card, it's your short term loans, you know, all of that is increased payments um, that is as a result of, of rising interest rates. It is good for us who have money in the bank, that little um, emergency fund that you earn more interest on it or your money market funds. But there's a, the knock on effect of, you know, how does the bank, what does the banks look like in rising interest rates? And I think that's where you play to your strengths, you understand that industry really well. You might not want to invest in your own share if it's, if it's listed, but there's another share that you think is doing really well in the same sector. You know, they might be the growth stock. You know, and that's where it comes in. You can have two portfolios with most brokers. And, and I think that's an important point. You can have your whichever life cycle you're at. And, and the portfolio matches that life cycle. Then you can ask your broker to open up a secondary account. Mm -hmm. and say, listen, this is a more speculative one that I'm willing to risk a bit of money on. And then you can trade in all these other little products and, and st stocks and risk a little bit more money um, to get a, additional capital growth, but it's not going to affect your retirement plan in the long run. I take the point in that, actually, and it reminds me way back in the day when I was younger and working at a stockbroker. We'd have folks who had themselves, you know, and, and mostly they were in that sort of second stage. They were somewhere between their sort of 35 to 60, maybe in the, the 40s or 50s. They would have a nice portfolio which was being managed by the experts. And then they would arrive one day and say, could I take a 2% carve out or 1% carve out, put this in an online platform for me, let me try my own hand at it as well. Um, and and you know, if, if they completely messed it up, it was a small enough percentage, it wasn't going to, to, to damage them. And they would essentially have two accounts, one which the professionals did, one which they did. And some of these folks got really good. And, and as they got better and more confident, they could sort of take more from the, the managed side. <laughs> the key point is, Started small, hey, learn to walk first. Yeah, exactly. You, you know, you've, whichever life cycle you're in, we refer back to the life cycle, you've now made a conscious decision to have a long term investment, right? Whether it's that growth stocks that you want to have for 10 or 15 years or the large caps. Um, but something could happen that in any of those large caps that you want to make, uh, take, you know, benefit in something else that's happening. You know, so don't. Don't liquidate your long-term portfolio because there's a goal attached to that long-term portfolio. But maybe take the dividends that got paid out this last season and switch that over to, to your short-term yeah, yeah. speculative account because it doesn't affect your long-term equity and you don't want to sell out because there's capital gains tax and the likes. So keep it simple and then grow with confidence. You, you might start trading equities on its own. Yeah. You might grow... And, and attend some seminars around derivatives and, and then um, start trading bigger sizes with, with limited risk, of course, um, but have the ability to not only have to look at your account on a Saturday <laughs> before the rugby or something or in the morning, but actually have a look at it on a day-to-day -day basis. Because yeah. on the long-term portfolio, Whatever happens day to day, the 1% move today, the 2% move tomorrow, the 3% move the other day, it's really not going to affect your decision around holding the stock. But you can benefit from a 1% or 2 or 3% move intraday in your speculative account. And that will you know, um, you know, create some more interest in, in, that, in that market. But I like the idea around the dividends, that cash flow that comes. Dividends are important, <clears throat> but some, some cash flow arrives over the last you know, six months. There's been some juicy dividends from, from banks and the like this year. Uh, well, maybe take that and instead of reinvesting, which would normally be the case, mm. take that and put it into your, your shorter term speculative. Uh, as we're talking, and, and we kind of started at the point, and, and it's becoming clearer and clearer, it, it's, around, it's around having a plan and even before that, it's around knowing what your goals are. You spoke about your life stages. Yeah. And that helps you understand your, your goals and, and your plan. But it, it really is sort of having that, 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 that broader picture in, in, in mind and understanding what you plan to do. And of course, the kids' education is, is a part of that. And maybe a 21st birthday uh, holiday or, or something like that. Having a plan which is going to be dynamic in a sense because life throws co co curveballs, uh, yeah. pandemics, ailments, uh, etc. But, but really having that and, and, and fitting it all together in, into that ultimate achieving of the goals. Yeah, I think it touches, it actually brings it back to diversification and, and rebalancing. So 
Firstly, you do the, do the diversification to ensure that you meet your goals. And then the rebalancing, which is an important factor as, as an investor. So uh, we spoke about it earlier on, a certain stock could get to the end of its life cycle. And yeah. you, you sell that out, you buy the next stock in. Um, and, and I think this is where investors make a battle with the, re, uh, the, the rebalancing of the portfolio. They get emotionally attached, we're human beings, we get emotionally attached to a stock. Um, it has given some poor performance. You didn't stick to a stop loss. And in your rebalancing process, you believe the stock is still gonna do well, and you sell something else out and you buy something else. But this stock is actually the one that's detracting from your, from your performance. So, um, and that's where uh, investment professionals removes that emotional attachment to a stock. And, uh, and we've had this discussions with many, many clients over the years that if you are emotionally attached to a share, I would suggest moving it out of the long-term portfolio because it's going to detract yeah. from, from the end goal. So if you want the stock because your grandfather still bought it through a share certificate <laughs> and it got, you know, that's the emotional sure. attachment. It might not be the company itself, but it's, it's your grandfather gave it to you as a present for your 21st. And, and you have this share certificate framed in your, in your study somewhere and you still hold the share, put it somewhere, still keep it, but rebalance your portfolio to meet your objectives. You know, so, uh, and, there, and there's an opportunity for both. I, I like that. And, and don't tell it in, in your core portfolio. I, I take that. There's something else which you kind of alluded to there, which is FOMO, the fear of, of missing out. And I'm thinking Fungella Resources, which has mm. been a, a phenomenal run. Um, but if you look at the, the volume, most of it happened sort of north of 300. Um, and it's being very cautious of, of falling into the trap. And the distinction is, it's a hard distinction to make between a great stock that's got great potential or a great stock that's now incredibly expensive and everyone's talking about it because it's done that, that meteorotic, meteorotic rise. Yeah, so, so I'll answer the question, I think, in two ways. So I refer to them as chasing the last winners. Mm -hmm. So you read about it in the newspaper, it shot the lights out, the market is pushing it up to a certain price which was already expensive when you looked at it the yeah. first time. Now you look at it the 10th time and it's like more than it was initially. And then you make a decision to buy the stock. So it could be cyclical uh, at that point yeah. that um, the smart money has already seen the capital appreciation. They're on the other side now They're selling, selling to, you. to us. Uh, the investor who has now caught on to the stock having rallied extremely uh, f far past, uh, exceeding its, its fair value effectively. Now we buy into it uh, and the, the smart money starts selling it downwards and before you know it, it's trading at fair value again. So you got sucked into this hype of wanting to buy the best performing stock, unit trust, etc. in the market at that point in time, but it's not the smart money thing to do. You know, and it's, it's that way, if you wanna change your portfolio, but do it in something else. Don't do it in, don't sell an existing winner to buy the stock that's exceeding the market at the moment. Yeah, that, that, that might be the next one. Let's talk quickly around asset allocation. We talked around it a bit up front in terms of you, you'd, have some, you'd have some equity, it might be a unit trust or individual shares or an ETF. Uh, you'd have some bonds and the like. Uh, then, of course, there's, there's gold. Uh, it's still folks out there like to have gold mm. in a portfolio. Um, there's your emergency fund. There's offshore. I mean, mm. we haven't even yet got to the offshore part of the component. I mean, are there sort of model percentages that you should say, well, it's quite simple. At this stage, you have X percent here and Y percent there, or is it a, a little more fluid? Because certainly, you need all the different asset classes and it is going to be dynamic as you move through those life stages. I think the, the rule of thumb generally is like 25% of your investment to be offshore uh, and 75% locally. And mm -hmm. I think that's historically been the rule of thumb. I think our investment universe in South Africa has shrunk drastically over the last couple of years. The number of shares delisting, the concentration risk around five banks, uh, resource stocks, um, in the top 40, so generally you would only want to have at least 20 of them, but you're still doubling up on some, on some sectors. I think the investment universe 
offshore is, is exciting. It has taken a massive beating this last year. Sure. Um, For the first time in a long time. Yeah. Well, I, outside I th- the pandemic, but yeah, I think it's I think it's returned more than double digit figures leading up to this year consistently, even if you do not take into con- into account the, the currency. So I think the S and P is thirteen or fourteen percent KGAR over the last decade compound annual growth rate. Yeah, exactly. And uh, so I think over time, as you as you get into that preparation phase. Um, you will start allocating more and more of your investment portfolio offshore. Um, I can't give you a figure, but it all depends on what you're trying to achieve. You know, because, and that you can have a discussion with your stockbroker or your wealth manager or, or whichever it is, um, or whichever number you're comfortable with. So if there's your, your top up that you were going to put into your local portfolio, you think, you know, I, I've, I think I'm fully invested locally, um, rather invest that offshore there are um, actively managed ETFs across the most of the jurisdictions, or you could have the single share exposure as well. Um, I think the, the, the Netflixes and all that have taken the biggest pain and, and you know, chip makers and the likes, but um, there are, I don't know, if, if, it depends on how many documents you read, there are more than 19,000 shares yeah. across 37,000 exchanges. Uh, that doesn't include uh, the, the ETF market. So the investment universe is, is massive out there. And that's where the additional research or, or, or work that you do around, around that investment becomes more and more important. It's, it's something that you don't know. It's an industry you might not be comfortable with or something that's pretty new uh, on the market. And I always tie back that, that time you spend on buying a stock equal to going and buying a car. You don't just walk into whichever garage it is and pick the first car that I you like see. the yellow one. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like the big one that's <laughs> light on juice and doesn't use diesel these days anymore, maybe a hybrid. But you start doing your research. Yeah. What, what price range can you afford? What is the specifications of the car? What is the fuel consumption? What's what important? is the security yeah. or the uh, end cap rating in terms of, of the car? So you do your research, uh, research around buying a car. Why don't you do the same research about buying a share? You know, it's hard and money that you set pending. So take the time, do the investigation. Um, and I think there are multiple platforms out there where you can ask questions around. You know, yeah, it's a good point. And, and we've certainly, you know, 20 years ago it was harder, but in this day and age, it's become so much easier to, to, to do that research. And again, it comes to the point we made earlier. You know, even if you don't work in the industry, we, we, have, we have got skills, we've got insight, we can ask questions um, and, and, and the like can do that. I, I want to go back to the offshore component. I think an important point is to take an holistic view because, of course, you've probably got some Reg 28 product, uh, which is a pension fund, a provident fund, a mm. retirement annuity, maybe a preservation fund. Um, and that's got some assets as well. So, yes, you've got potentially some managed portfolio with a, with, with a broker. You've got some DIY portfolio you're doing with yourself. Heck, we haven't even touched on the tax-free component yet. Yeah. And Reg 28. And you actually need to look at them, all of them together. Because yeah. you, know, you, you might say, well, you know, I, I want to go X percent offshore. But the question is, well, what's your offshore waiting here? What's your, 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 your uh, maybe uh, uh, cash or near cash waiting in this one? get an Excel spreadsheet and put it all together. And you can do that even with your Reg 28, they'll send you uh, uh, quarterly statements. Yeah, I think with most Provident Fund, pension funds these days, they send you what they call a minimum disclosure document. Yeah. In the old days, it used to be called a fund fact sheet, yes. which tells you what assets, what shares, what bonds, what is the weighting to the, to the shares. And, and then when you structure your portfolio, don't go and mimic what they've done, because then you're doubly investing in the same thing. And that's where diversification comes back in. So if they've got a certain weighting to this stock, buy something else. You mm-hmm. know? So, and that comes back to your, your, the ability to do the analysis these days has become a lot better. The ability to have access to information at your fingertips. Yeah. Um, technology is involved, comes onto your mobile device if you put an alert on, or you have access to sends announcements the same as an asset manager or a fund manager. You, you have technology at the tip of your fingers and, and use it. Yeah, no, it is. It, it always, we live in the future. I mean, I keep on saying it, and then the next day is back to the future. Another question from Sean. You're saying the extent of your stop loss. Um, 
And this perhaps is the really, really hard question. I mean, so, so you've bought the share, whatever it might be, uh, uh, whatever the stock is, you plan to hold it for the next three to five years, um, but you want to protect, you want that stop loss in it. Uh, is it 5%, is it 50%, or is it have a hard look at the, at the chart and, and try and make a decision from that? Because I'll be frank with you, that's the part I struggle with still after, after decades <laughs> in the market. I think the, there is no holy grail in terms of what the stop loss should be. I think it depends on your risk appetite. As you, as you enter the trade, you have to put what are you willing to lose. Mm -hmm. Now, the, uh, Sean asks around volatility uh, and the like. So the South African market has multiple sectors um, that they're trading. So let's call it the large caps, mm -hmm. um, the Anglos, Billiton, Sassels, top 40 shares kind of thing, have very low volatility. So between three and 5% a day kind of thing. Then you have the, the secondary market, so let's not call it secondary, the, the second tier market. Um, still quality stocks, but they will be slightly more volatile. It could be up to 10% intraday volatility. And then they have the, the, which we used to call the alternative index or alternative exchange stocks. And they can have anything up to 25% volatility yeah. intraday. So have a look at the stock have a look at the historical pricing because you don't want to put a uh, buy in the Z04 stocks, which I'll refer to, and it has intraday volatility of 25% and you put a 20% stop loss, you'll be stopped out every day. It's just someone having... It's just, the, just the bid and offers are just too wide. Yeah. Uh, the liquidity is low. So the volatility and liquidity um, determines how volatile or, or where your stop losses should be, but it's where you're comfortable, you know, so... You can't be stopped out every day uh, and re-enter the trade every day. Um, the, if the market is moving in a certain direction, don't try and force it into a different direction. You know, you'll be wrong 90% <laughs> of the time. So if the market is moving in a certain direction, if you've been stopped out, stay out. And when it's stabilized again, then try and get back in or buy something else. But the market is telling you something when it's falling drastically. It is, and, and then it comes to the issue, we touched on it earlier, which is, you're, from, from, as I'm understanding from what you're saying, you're making decisions and you're not worrying about the tax. We said earlier tax is an outcome of, of, of a successful uh, uh, trade, the, the, the tax is the byproduct. You, you, yeah. you don't look at it and say, oh, now there's tax. If it's the right decision to make, the tax will simply look after itself, um, otherwise we start getting into heaps of pain. Exactly. Um, you should not take tax in consideration when you rebalancing your portfolio. Tax is a byproduct. Um, the fact that you're paying tax, you're making money, which is, is tough for us to pay over, but it, it allows you to take the next, an emotional decision around the next investment. And I think that, uh, and I keep on mentioning, and I, and, I, and I say it constantly, is where the investment professional um, takes that unemotional decision around what the portfolio should look like. You agree it up, on, up, up front, you might have a personal relationship, but I don't have a personal relationship with your portfolio. There's an outcome and a goal we need to achieve, and emotion doesn't form part of that decision making. Yeah, I, I, I take that. And it, it is, I mean, you know, one of the risks, and certainly when I was starting, there was a lot more of it, but it was the thrill of the, of, mm. of the winner. You, you know, I, I was trading warrants in the, in the late 90s, and, and you buy it at 40 cents, and it's 44 cents the next day, and you just, you know, not only do you feel like a genius, you just, you actually, you, you like to rush too much, and, mm. and you start, I mean, I was making horrendous decisions just because of the thrill, and, and, and it, 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 was, it was a horror space. We need to, and it's easy for you and I to sit here and say it, we need to be clear, analytical, unemotional, right decision for the right reason. Yeah, and I think the, the thrill can be, can be substituted with the alternative portfolio. So I like that. If you, if you want to trade, if you want to have that thrill, that uh, exciting feeling of being involved, uh, not too exposed, but involved, you know, there are alternative products out there that, could, that offer you that, that thrill. Um, daily <laughs> and the risk daily. Well, that, there's, a, there's a flip side to that throw, right? Exactly. <laughs> I didn't mention the pain part. <laughs> yeah, so uh, yeah, th there's a product for most uh, investors out there and I think it's about choosing the right one at the right time uh, and sticking, sticking to those decisions, which is the hard part.
Yeah, yeah, it is. But I, again, I like your idea. Have the thrill in that small little part there so that it might damage your, your heart, but it won't damage your, your portfolio. Correct. And let's quickly touch on trading. We've, we've got uh, five and a half minutes left. Um, we've been talking equity here. In, in trading, you mentioned the derivatives, the CFDs, the futures. We've got listed options, which are the warrants and the like. Um, and I see a lot of folks who come along and they jump straight into the deep end, which is futures. And again, it's, it's learning to walk. It's saying, well, I want to do some trading. Let's just start with, 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 with equity. You can trade the shares. You don't need that derivative or that gearing. And as you skill up and get the knowledge, you can move into the, the riskier and more rewarding part of the trading environment. Yeah, I think you've hit the nail on the head there. It is exactly that. You, the, the derivative market is so geared. So it gives you the opportunity to make massive profits, but massive losses yep. at the same time. Intraday, it settles daily. Um, so get familiar with how trading works, how the market works, more importantly, how the shares operate in that market, what are the trading times you know, of, those, of the market. <laughs> um, a lot of people get um, pulled into FX trading. Yeah. And uh, I'm sure all of you know it, FX trades 24 hours a day. Yeah which means at two o'clock in the morning when you're having a sleep, you're getting a margin call and you're closed out because the liquidity at that time in the market is so low, someone trades something silly and you're closed out. And two seconds later, it prices fairly again. So understand what you're trading, find your feet, get rid of your training wheels like we all did when we started riding a bicycle, yeah. and then take a stab at derivatives. So the derivative thrill is the ability to buy 100 rands worth of shares for 10 rand. Yeah. The problem we have there generally is they buy 100 rands worth of derivatives <laughs> <laughs> instead of just 10 rands worth of derivatives. So the thrill is there if it goes up, it's a 100 rand profit. But if it goes down, it's a 100 rand loss. Uh, and that's where that over trading, over gearing comes into play. And if you don't understand the market, it's going to hurt you quickly. And, um, and that's why it's important, find your feet with equity trading. If you think there are certain stocks that have some nice volatility intraday, and there are some stocks, mm -hmm. you know, Naspers is one of them, yeah. Process, um, Sassel, where you can participate intraday in a 3% move, but know the stocks that have those volatilities and then trade the right product. And yeah, to the point, learn to walk. We've got a lifetime of doing this. We don't need to, to rush into it. Uh, we need to wrap, and I want to go right back to the beginning, which is, in a sense, it, it's, it's depending on your life stage as to what you're doing, but it goes to what we said a little while ago. It's knowing what you're trying to achieve, how you're going to achieve it, understanding that there is help and assistance, which might be an ability to find a research report or perhaps have a conversation with a broker or, or a managed portfolio. It's finding what works for you and what your goals are, which is really important. And, and each individual on, on, on this video this morning, I mean, we can almost make it bespoke for each of them in a sense. They've all got different needs. Mm. Yeah, I agreed. I, I think that's where, if you understand where you are, what you want to achieve, and if you, if you battle with that goal setting or battle with the emotional side of trading or battle with spending enough time on your portfolio, there are investment professionals out there, as we mentioned. And I think I would strongly advise people to speak to an investment advisor. Um, they've spent many, many years in the industry. They qualified. Um, it's like us going to a lawyer or a doctor. You know, yeah, they're professionals. <laughs> you know, so they do it day in, day out. You know, investment professionals have it maybe slightly harder because the market can have negative returns or zero returns and it makes a difficult discussion. But Speak to an investment professional. Um, most of them will see you uh, at any time uh, of the day kind of thing, work with you. And if you don't agree with what they're saying, you can move on. You know, it's around that relationship that yeah. you have or you feel comfortable with the person and you, and you entrust them with your money. We all entrust our pension and provident funds. No questions to just asked. No questions <laughs> asked. We they just take half the time we don't know who money off my account. <laughs> <laughs> Send it to me when I'm 60. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, uh, but you, there, there are some, some of those same professionals that can do the similar thing for you. Do not, not to replace your pension or provenance fund, but to you know, uh, complement it 
for the retirement age. Yeah, and I like that. Know where you are. That's so important. And 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 know your skill set. Don't don't try and get out of your comfort zone. And what you say there in terms of you know we're happy to go to professionals when we're sick or when we need you know legal advice or something. Uh, we can absolutely do it here. We can DIY. We can also do it as a as a small slice to make it perhaps a little less risky for us. We'll leave that there. That was our Grant Bank. He's, he's head of trading at NetBank Private Wealth Securities. I'm Simon Brown. We're going in for a short break. We'll be back at 11 o'clock. Uh, Rick van Niekerk will be back for session three. And of course, we'll be going on for the rest of the day as well. Grant, really appreciate the time today. Thanks, Simon. Really enjoyed it.